Yuvan, you froze in. Are you there? Yeah, I'm there. <laughs> hey, my okay. internet is the worst. Good Lord. <laughs> okay, we've started. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hey, guys. I have no idea what happened to the previous uh, session, but if you guys are still there, uh, we will definitely get those questions answered. We will send it over to Chirag, and I am very, uh, I'm very happy and grateful that he was willing to do that, give that session. It was very informative and very necessary. So now let's go on to our next speaker, uh, Yuvan. Okay, Yuvan, can you please pronounce your surname for me? Yuvan, Yuvan is fine. Yuvan? Yeah. Are you there? Yeah, I'm there. But uh, can you pronounce your surname because? Okay, I just came back, didn't I? Yes. Yeah. Hi. I'm so sorry. My internet is bad and it's possible I will go off and on a few times. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see if the live streaming is still on though. Okay. Cool. We are still on. Everything is good. Hi. Yeah. So can you answer your, uh, tell me what your surname is? Because I've been wanting My to surname, ask so I, so, for the longest of time. Okay, so I am. My surname is my mom's name. Her name is Margaret Lawrence. Uh, because I I live with her. I, I live with my mom. So that was kind of legally, yeah. So that's my surname. Yeah. But then why is it Aves? Is it because it's avian? Oh, oh okay. That is uh, so. Um, I mean, if I can. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's, you know, is it okay avian that connection no so there was a point in my life for five six years it was not clear what my surname was so i chose my own oh and then it stayed <laughs> on in various platforms so some some people write mails saying mr aves i wonder whether i should tell them or not and so you know my, <laughs> yeah okay so uh, uh, this session is going to be very interesting session um as you know, Yuvan Aves, he is a naturalist, writer, and activist based in Chennai. He's been part of several social and environmental campaigns in his city and in other states. He's also spent many years developing curricula for na nature education in schools, which I personally think is a brilliant thing. He is the recipient of the M. Krishnan Memor Memorial Nature Writing Award. And his book, A Naturalist Journal, is a collection of essays on countryside wilderness. Yeah, so I am extremely excited to have him and maybe I can have a conversation. And uh, yeah, so guys, uh, I hope whoever is watching this has gone on to our Facebook page, Fridays for Future India, and all those questions that were asked over the past 12 hours. If you all have answered it, I hope you all are sitting here to get your answers for it. 
because Yuvan has asked you those questions and we are going to get them answered right now. So Yuvan, do you want to say something before we start the question answer session? Um, let's jump in. Uh, what this session is really about is this period of lockdown when uh, uh, it's being used as leverage to make environmental clearances because the streets are sealed away from us. Streets happen to be our main medium for campaign and protest and expression. So this is a kind of a conducive time to do things when we don't have power to act. Although there are novel ways, imaginative ways in which people all across our country are finding to express dissent uh, and they're working. So this session is really about that in different uh, campaigns, projects which are getting visibility and several which are not because of the sheer number of clearances which have been made. Yeah. During this time, yeah. And uh, if there if there are any questions, guys, you can ask, and I will uh, answer. I will pass them on to Yuvan at that moment also because this is more like an informal conversation and having the questions asked already so we can go ahead with that just don't mind me because i'm going to be switching from things so i might take a little bit of time but i hope yuvan entertains you in that process okay so the first question that was asked was uh which is the only sanctuary in india dedicated to an endangered monkey yeah so uh, I will say the answers right now. There are a lot of answers saying Silent Valley. There is Aga Shini, Assam, the lion-tailed macaque, Sharavati Sanctuary, Sharavati Wildlife Sanctuary. Then there's Vietnam and South India. Uh, there's Dehing Patkai, Molem, uh, Valaparai. And uh, I think there was one more, Periyar. So, Yuva, do you want to go ahead with this, please? So, uh, interesting echoes in the question. Some of them are uh, uh, from the past uh, of, of a similar project. So, when we, so the answer happens to be Sharavati Lion Tail Macaque Sanctuary which is the only wildlife sanctuary for this specific monkey. It's an endangered monkey, only found in the Western Ghats. There are about 3,500 individuals left in the wild, or in fact, lesser. From an earlier study, this, this was the case. Um, and uh, Sharavati, the project is about a pumped storage facility. Now, what that means is, now before that, the Sharavati uh, Dam itself, uh, is one of those projects which we are not speaking about. A lot of projects are being spoken about, especially in the Northeast, because of the extraordinary mobilization of uh, uh, students there and their active uh, voices. Sharavati, not so much, perhaps a few posts at the max. Here, what is happening is uh, a dam, a rather ineffective version of a dam. It's called a pump storage facility. What you do is you pump water from a lower level you create a reservoir by raising down uh, forest and land and excavating, pump the water up, and then when you are uh, facing uh, electricity demand, you let that water flow down, run your turbine and generate electricity. So it's a, it's a dam which is, in a sense, uh, most gory of them all. Um, uh, interesting that Silent Valley is mentioned because when the Silent Valley National Park had a dam coming in, there was a huge protest. I was a little kid then, but I remember reading it in my environmental education books and all that. It's, it's a very saliently stated example of, of protest, uh, especially for a dam. That was also the flagship species was the lion tail macaque. And that uh, really moved the protest and moved the authorities because of its uh, rare status. So, yeah, that is the answer to that. And if, if uh, we can make no more noise about this project, that would, be, uh, that would be great. It needs to be spoken about more. It is a 200 megawatt uh, dam. It's a pretty big one. It's a huge dam. And right now, 
geo technical investigation so before you build a dam you need to drill into the soil into the uh, river bed to see what the soil profile is where the bedrock is to understand how you can go forth with your project those have been given clearance and they have uh, if i am not wrong uh, started in some sense so this needs uh, more visibility and uh... can you as an i for me it's just can you imagine the stress that the monkeys must be going through because of the sound and the vibration and i think imagine you have only some such a less number of them and we are not taking them into consideration and going in for a project where they live i yeah that's that's something that i i also personally feel that people need to talk more about this yeah. project okay So now let's go to the second question that you had asked, which was your second question was, what threatens Binong Wildlife Sanctuary in Uttarakhand? Mm -hmm. Yes, and yeah. the answers are one second, guys. Poaching, over interference of human activity, pine trees, which causes forest fires. the lakhwar vyasi hydel dam the hydro project coal mining these are the answers for that project for that okay. question of yours so i so think there was know. a right uh, it, uh, it's a dam lakhwar vyasi dam is what is being built in one of the uh, tributaries of yamuna which uh, starts further ahead um in the rajaji national park within which binog wildlife sanctuary is and it's a special place because it's the northwestern limit of our bengal tigers of our asian elephants beyond which they are not found that kind of demarcates their range their boundary um it's a small dam uh it's 300 megawatts but it's also been cleared uh, right now and amidst a lot of uh, the raging fires in uttarakhand and um, just uh, beyond uh, binong wildlife sanctuary also is a project which is not being spoken about which is uh, gangotri national park there is a defense structure coming up in a, in a large area we don't know what that is because defense projects details are not on the public domain and there is some uh, questions uh, regarding what that has already or will spark off our relationship with other countries we share a border with uh these regions of the himalayas right now are under threat uh, and they are rare habitats so yes um, so an interesting part about this yeah. lakhwar vyasi dam which i had actually researched about is the fact that it has been going on since i think 1980s and uh it has actually been opposed by environmentalists again and again and again and it has always come back and, and on the paper as a project and the fact that it's a seismic land and there are going to be earthquakes on it and an interesting fact is the eia was not adequate and they have not gone back and done any more environmental studies on it so i don't know how on what basis are they pushing it and i don't know how it was passed i yeah one, one important point uh or like you said was that lot of projects including this one which have been passed over for decades fearing the public outrage are being cleared now which, yeah which raises questions we other projects will be talking about later including uh, and this one are ones which have been deferred for decades even uh, the sharavati project has been deferred yes. for a long yeah. period of time yeah yeah okay uh question 3 which was which is the second largest mangrove forest in india okay and the answers we've gotten are bitakanika uh pichavaram sundarbans then koringa yeah that's that those are the four options that happen 
post sent to us so all of them are uh, prominent mangrove forests sundarban being the biggest and uh, koringa being the second largest which is now uh, threatened by a housing project let's look at that uh, a bit later but i i'll tell you a little story uh, somebody i know here he's a very prominent mangrove scientist his name is dr kadiresan uh, his lifetime four decades of work is on mangroves of uh, india and southeast asia he uh, has done a very interesting uh, study uh, which is he went to odisha somebody had uh, uh, mentioned bitter kanika which is a large mangrove forest in odisha he had gone there when the fani cyclone had just struck odisha in 1999 it was one of the biggest cyclones our coast has faced it was called a super cyclone the death toll was about 10000 and it was known also because the chief minister's house literally flew away with the cyclone so he had gone there and he was looking at he was assessing the damage and the death toll and then he went to bitter kanika he went to mangal jodi where large dense tracts of mangroves were still present and he looked at the rural folk and the local people living there and they were untouched by this this tyrannical uh, cyclone and then he kind of understood the the bulwarks uh, the shields uh, mangroves are uh, so he came back to tamil nadu uh, he's from annamalai university he came back here and uh, he said uh, see we we are also prone to cyclones and we also had natural mangrove systems pichavaram is a large mangrove forest in uh, tamil nadu so he along places in kadalur in pondicherry places where he had access to he planted uh, mangrove forests in fact aryan kuppam which is now a important coastal marine biodiversity area is almost an entirely reforested place by him and his students so he planted all along here and some people were happy with it because mangroves kind of host uh, fingerlings uh, breeding pools of fish and other kinds of things which uh, let uh, local economies uh, are depend on but some were not happy there were different places where people were like hey this is in the way of my boats i want to take it and chuck it away that happened but in some places they grew to maturity 2004 tsunami struck us it is the largest disaster to have happened on the indian coast and huge death toll huge damage to property and these places where he had actually planted the mangroves the fishing communities came to his university office and they were in tears they said we went untouched and uh, thank you uh, thanks to you so that is the significance of mangroves and mangroves made huge news at that time and we seem to have forgotten it and coming back to koringa you are building a housing project near the coast and where mangroves are they are uh, what do you call turbulent places now if i may just share my screen i'll just show you uh, a few things kind of adaptations mangroves have uh i missed showing this this is a uh, just a picture of a lion tail macaw which uh, taken by my friend vikas who's uh, been in the, in those parts uh, it's more lion than just in being its tail it has a mane and when it yawns its mouth yeah. looks like a carnivore with those huge canines <laughs> can you show the picture please uh, are you not able us? to see my picture ah uh, no we can't see the picture i am screen sharing okay let me okay let me start this again okay i think you need to allow me to share that no, thing I... no no you can screen share okay i'm clicking again can you see uh it's loading yes i can see it okay very good so this is the lion tail mm. macaw so it could be called lion faced macaw it could be lion teeth macaw to be <laughs> lion tail macaw so it has a lot of lion in its looks um mm. let's go to mangroves yeah okay so mangroves have these extraordinary adaptations so these are what you see here are still roots they live in the intertidal zone where the sea is washing in and washing out every 6 hours uh in fact when you grow mangroves as bonsai plants some people do some friends i know do 
you have to keep pouring salt water every six hours and then make it very dry for uh, the next six hours. You have to kind of maintain it in that pattern. So these are still true. You kind of hold it up like octopuses above the water when the high tide washes in. And then when that washes out, these guys are like standing on little wooden posts. The mangroves have another adaptation. This is in uh, close to my home, Nadiar Punga. These are called snorkel roots. So those mangroves which are not standing on stilts, they have snorkels. So they kind of reach out above the water to breathe when the high tide washes in. And then they wash out as this huge bed of bed of arrows, you see. Especially in Koringa and Sundarbans, is like a place where you can't walk. You know, uh, it's like that. All these spines, uh, spokes out of the ground. So, uh, I'll just stop the screen share now. Uh, so, th so, those are mangroves and they grow. See, there are two places spoken about when... Uh, about uh, unpredictability of, of portions of ocean in the world, about how they keep spewing out cyclones and storms, and you, it has a very uh, turbulent and unpredictable nature. One is our Bay of Bengal, and the other is the Caribbean Sea. And very interestingly, the eastern coast of India, which demarcates the Bay of Bengal, has the greatest diversity and density of mangroves. And mangroves live there, for a reason, you know, land has its, has its uh, sense and intelligence. So if you are building a housing, this housing project, the, the government, state government of Andhra Pradesh is building, uh, is for, uh, is it part of its housing project. So it's, it's, it's for underprivileged people, it's for rural folk. If you're putting them there and when cyclone strikes, that entire 100 acres of mangrove cleared forest is, is going to get wiped out. Only mangroves can live where mangroves live. And certainly humans cannot live where you clear the mangroves and you're staying there. A lot, in fact, a lot of uh, experts I know are analyzing how Amphan, which is hitting uh, the further up the east coast, would have been completely uh, buffered if mangroves were left there. So, yeah, that's about the Kuringa Wildlife Sanctuary. And I think it's so important right now to protect our mangroves because the uh, cyclones are just going to get bigger and worse with climate change. And we really need to take that into consideration because if we don't, we are literally uh, like walking into the valley of death. It's actually that. Yeah, so uh, just letting you know those pictures that you showed me took me back to my school days where I actually studied about mangroves and you won't believe these small factors that you told me were like oh yeah you know because I love like I love all these things so these things just stayed with me okay now the next one is in the in the Goan forest in I think we missed, uh, we missed a uh, famous bird sanctuary. Oh, okay. One second. Okay, can I come back to that later then? Sure. Okay. Yeah? So, yeah. just remind me. Yeah. Now, in this Goan forest, black panthers have been sighted. And the responses that we've gotten for that is Bhagwan Mahavir Wildlife Sanctuary, Bhagwan Mahadev Wildlife Sanctuary, uh, Molem, and uh, yeah, someone has said uh, Sharavati. So, uh, yes, can you Let please me quickly share my screen here again? Please let me know if you see the shared screen. You able to yes. see? Okay, yes. no, I have to skip this. So, yes, it's Bhagwan, Mahavir, and uh, Molem are the right answers. You know, this is a little screenshot from uh, my friend Sanjana, who's also an FFF, from her post mm. on Instagram. So, this is mm. a triple whammy. There are three projects which have been cleared here. So, one is a transmission line you see here. And then there's a highway kind of dissecting the wildlife sanctuary and the national park. And then there's a railway line uh, kind of going into right into the heart of the national park. All of these present and all of these which have been on uh, deferment for a very long time have been cleared now. 
Now, let me show you uh, this specific, uh, uh, what do you call, cause needs immediate uh, uh, notice because these are pictures from two days ago, uh, shared by uh, uh, a friend and, and, and a prominent scientist, uh, Nandini Velho. She's from Goa and she also studies Northeast forests. This is from Bhagwan Mahavir. So this is where the highway and the transmission are coming and they are starting to be cleared. And uh, there's another picture from there. And just adjacent to uh, Mahavir, there is the Netravati, another sanctuary. And along these forests is one of those rare places where you see Black Panther, because you see it in Kabini, but you also see it here. And, uh, and there is a lot of outrage uh, coming because of uh, how hasty uh, uh, the manner in which this is being uh, going through and people are not able to do anything about it. Um, but uh, yeah, so these are pictures of damage being, damage occurring right now in Goa. Yeah, and um, can you go back and uh, yeah. if you talk about this highway that is passing through and through, there mm. are a lot of people who are saying that they are doing it with the utmost care and they are having, uh, allowing, my, uh, even though it's going to fragment the forests and not allow migration, but they're going to have these migratory paths for animals to go across. What is your take on that? You see, we look at the habitats physically. There is also the non-physical uh, part of the habitat, which is the soundscape. If a very simple example is my home right here, which has a road which came recently. And all the habitat is intact. There's a lot of fallow land. But when the road came, all the songbirds vanished mm. because they need that soundscape. Animals are sensitive to sound and light, not just to, there could be the water body existing, there could be the trees still there. But once there is sound stress, light stress, animals will go away. And uh, mm. th that is that is uh, the thing. And uh, these are the railway line is also saving, I think, about an hour of travel from an existing railway line, which is also uh, cutting through the forest, but uh, which could be used. But this is saving merely about an hour of time uh, cutting through Molam National Park freshly. Yeah. So the question is, do we save one hour of time or do we let our animals survive? Exactly. It's, it's animals, it's us. Another very important thing is it's wilderness, it's forest, it's climate change, but it's also a lot of local community. Every yes. single habitat True. from the glaciers to the deserts to these forests have local communities living there, living as part of the forest, as significant in their role as the tigers and the trees and the uh, other uh, beings which live there. So they are also uh, affected uh, vastly by this. Very, very true. Very true. Yeah. Uh, okay. Next one is the uh, next question. I'm sorry, every time something happens, you uh, it kind of gets me down to know that there are so many deforestation projects happening at one time. Okay, next one. What activity has been allowed where this animal lives? And the animal is a lion. Okay. So yeah. the questions are... Uh, one second. Um, I think no activities are allowed there. Okay. That's one answer. I someone, see. Said, <laughs> someone said limestone. Okay. Yeah. Actually, yeah. The, the other person also said, I don't know. So if you can enlighten us. Fine. So the Asiatic lion, uh, the only, only place which in which it, where, where it's found in India is Gir National Park in Gujarat. Earlier, during the British times, uh, there are multiple records of it roaming central India, right up till uh, grasslands of Andhra Pradesh. I, uh, they've all been hunted down, poached. Right now, their only habitat is uh, uh, Gir National Park. And um, they are a... Uh, um, a species under extraordinary stress because they're living very close together and any kind of disease spreads very fast. And they're also suffering because of inbreeding, uh, breeding within their families, which kind of weakens uh, their offspring. 
right now uh in uh, we we are right six months uh, into this year there have been two dozen lion deaths because of a uh, disease a blood disease lion blood disease called babesiosis uh about 24 Babe- lions have died yeah, yeah. how do, how do i pronounce that sorry uh, babesiosis babesiosis okay. babesiosis yeah you're the vet so okay. <laughs> yeah so there are already uh, nearly uh, 30 lions uh, which have died already this year within this year so they are a stressed species and there are only 500 less than 500 uh, left in the wild so they are far far more threatened than the tiger so here what has been allowed is limestone is right there are three limestone projects which have been allowed here and one black trap mining uh, project which has been allowed here and and this is quite appalling and uh, as far as i've seen of course i'm also i've not spoken about this project uh, uh, being active in other kinds of uh, campaigns and uh, very less visibility is being uh, given to this uh, issue and this is also a place where a lot of illegal limestone mining and other kinds of mining has been happening and has been persecuted and uh, these projects also have been in uh, floating before being uh, uh, implemented now and if you look at the minutes of the meeting of nbwl a important document to understand all that which has happened during the lockdown um, they are they say after each project especially uh, this uh, the chief wildlife warden has given permission for this provided the wildlife is untouched provided you return the habitat to the same uh, condition as it was before provided they make some green belt somewhere to mine limestone and to pl- mine uh, black trap black trap is uh, black stone like basalt rip trap blue stone what we use in our roads and uh, uh, eroding posts you know the large black stones how you mine them is you first raise down the forest you excavate the land till almost bedrock or till the uh, uh, necessary depth and then you d- dynamite you use explosives uh, uh, dangerous and and very very loud explosives to blast the rock and then uh, extract them so how do you return the place back to its shape and how do you do it without uh, affecting the wildlife you know i i would strongly recommend who was watching and and even uh, uh, perhaps we can put it up what the conditions are uh, the the wildlife uh, national board of wildlife has allowed these projects uh, uh, pertaining to a uh, lot of them cannot be done you cannot mine limestone you cannot uh, dig up coal and then return the place to its original uh, shape so those are the conditions quoted yeah i think it's very important for everyone to know because even in all all mining places this is actually the issue that every all of them are facing and it's very easy to say but we are taking care of it but then what is the effects that the animals will go through with the process only is not being looked at okay uh next one and also the funny part is we don't know much about what's happening in gujarat about the limestone mining apparently the people themselves have been protesting and there's nothing about it so what i think this to... community land the uh, uh, three of the limestone projects are in community owned forests where in the buffer zone of the national park where people the local tribes there are living uh, off the forest uh, and dependent on the land there uh, hmm. so it's it's happening there so it's actually kind of displacing them and also taking over their fields and and where they living to do this mining and once mining is done you cannot live there there's a lot yeah. of leaching there's a lot of uh, residue um, a lot of uh, pollution that creates it contamination of the surrounding land okay next one in maharashtra where would you see this antelope Uh, we are yeah. missing the bird sanctuary that's kind of one of my favorites oh, and something oh. i'm presently fighting about okay wait wait, wait. the bird sanctuary yeah what is the question so uh, which 
famous bird sanctuary is this and there was a picture ha which famous bird sanctuary do you see in this picture and the answer oh no ha nal sarovar nal sarovar vedantangal bharatpur bird sanctuary yeah i think those are the four question answers that i've got in okay so it is vedantangal now this is a clearance which happened this week 3 days ago when i sat down to work on something else i got a phone call from a, a naturalist society friend saying hey this has happened do you know i said no and then i had to put everything aside and kind of yeah, so it's it's 3 days old uh just uh before before we get into the the, the gloom and doom of the project let's look at the beauty of the place uh yes this is please. this is vedantangal so vedantangal is a very rare example of community human bird relationship human animal relationship uh tens of thousands of birds come here a lot of them uh migratory and nest here and about 40000 birds are uh, over 40000 birds are recorded to be nesting here every year uh, during the season between november and march this is a very old lake so in this uh, stretch of kanchipuram and kadalur it was a very desert like arid land centuries ago so kings at the time cholas and the pallavas who were living here they dug thousands of lakes in this region so that they could harvest rain water the seasonal rivers flowing here also would flow 2 3 uh, months during the year and wouldn't hold enough water to, for people to cultivate and do agriculture so this is one of those lakes it's a man made lake which is turned into one of the greatest uh, community conservation bird sanctuaries in in india and it's the oldest it was uh, declared in 1936 but it's been protected for centuries and centuries because um one of the reasons is farmers understood so this is completely agrarian land the entire uh, vedantangal area as well as surrounding villages is uh, where paddy is cultivated paddy is the large, uh, major occupation of the people there bird guano falling in the water and that water bird guano means bird poop basically Uh, so uh, what falls in there and be, being used to irrigate the fields gives them a bumper yield vedantangal yield is famous it's about 2 2.5 times more than the surrounding villages the rice yield they get because of the water they use from this lake and so these are some pictures so this is black headed ibis ibis is build not one they don't build nests for themselves they build a communal nest this huge platform a shared house so now all these female birds kind of take spaces and then and kind of nest in that in that large uh, platform um you can see the picture right yeah 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 ah, okay fine <laughs> so this is a painted stock uh with its nest and around you can see pelicans and darters and open bill stocks um are these pictures taken by you yeah these are pictures i've taken by me so where the angle is something i've gone Uh, without exaggeration hundreds of times i've been going there since i was an infant because it's very close it's it's about uh, one and a half hours drive away and it being a very historic and, and significant place i've been taken there so many times and just in the last two years i've taken children children i teach numerous times there and that's where i do my my birding modules as a teacher bird calls you enter vedantangal the soundscape transforms it's it's a it resounds with beak clatter and squawks and and uh, and the, the smell of the the barringtonia and the water it's it's a extraordinary place and th- this lake as you see has this very special tree called barringtonia whose canopy is like a straight pl- platform and those trees were planted there by villagers because they wanted birds to breed there because in in lakes trees don't grow barringtonia is a very special tree it can grow in inundated uh, land so so they, they there are about 500 to 600 trees within the lake itself uh, and that's where uh, birds nest the problem uh, the the threat it's facing right now is that um, so before that birds have come to trust this place so they come here and then any of these birds you see here, so i am very close to this bird my camera cannot zoom too much i am about 
at the most 40 meters. If a painted stock saw me uh, near a marshland where I live in Chennai, it would fly away, a mile away. Here it trusts the people because it's a centuries old relationship, a trust. You go there, you're sitting by birds which are nesting right overhead. They don't care. They completely uh, have, have, you know, uh, have an understanding with the people there. And people here do not celebrate Diwali. They do not uh, have large microphones. They do not have those uh, festivals where the lo loud music is being put. That's all that is banned because to protect uh, these birds and, and not stress them out. Now to the project there. Now there's a company called Sun Pharmaceuticals, which has been illegally operating from within the core zone of Vedandam. Uh, and... So far, it's being kept mum because it's sitting inside a wildlife sanctuary. And during the lockdown, it's pushing the state to get clearance for itself so that it can legalize where it's sitting and expand. So 40% of the sanctuary is being reduced. And their claim is that so Vedanangal is a lake and then around it is scrubland. Nesting of the birds happens in the lake. Around it is fields and fields, acres of fields of farmers and scrubland. They are saying... Nothing comes here. But I've been there, I've taken children there, hundreds of people have been there. You can uh, check eBird for yourselves. Birds come here to forage. It's, the lake is only a breeding place. Birds come out to forage, to pick nest material, to roost. The, the outer zone is as essential as the inner, as the water body itself. And uh, they've given a clearance and now it's standing in front of the NBWL and we're doing all we can to uh, stop this. And uh, we are doing a Twitter storm on Sunday uh, for, for this cause. Interestingly, one of the uh, uh, prime uh, things which has pushed this forward is the biodiversity report, which perhaps uh, I could share if uh, you don't mind. Yeah, uh, sure. Look, so this is a black-headed ibis. Any birders, you know, it's a, it's a nesting bird, the painted stock. Yeah. yeah. Now let's see. These are from Vedandangal. Uh, you have my word for it. Hmm. Uh, let's see the biodiversity report. Now we will have it in some. Mm. Okay, I, I do not have it immediately, but I, I will put it up on my. Uh, I have shared highlights of it on my Instagram, uh, hmm. which perhaps people can look at. Uh, none of these birds have been covered. There are over 190 species there. But they've left out all the migratory species and the nesting species because that gives problems for you. Once you add migratory species in your EIA, in your biodiversity report, people will ask you questions. This is like how the Wildlife Institute of India left out the tiger in Dibang Valley. They said there are no tigers there because if you bring in the tiger, then it's problems for your dam. It's, it's a very, very protected species. So they're claiming there are only 25 species of birds here. And they've left out all the migrants, all the nesting birds from the water body. And they claim to have done a 10 kilometer radius survey around their factory. Today, I was with the Panchayat president there. He says the locals are opposed to it. There's a big lake which we use for our cattle and for our own irrigation, which is completely turned black by uh, Sun Pharmaceuticals. Uh, so it's as much a local uh, people's and farmers fight as it's a uh, uh, fight for wilderness and, and these birds. Yeah. Yeah. I hope whoever is listening to this, uh, we need to really do something. We need to stand up for our environment and our nature and our animals, especially the ones, especially because they can't speak. And I think we are done with taking away what is theirs. We really need to stop. Okay, so let's get to the next question. In Maharashtra, where would you go to see the antelope or this antelope? And the answers we've gotten are Rehkri Black Buck Sanctuary, Taroba, and the Western Ghats. These are the three options. You want? Okay. Okay, so... So that is a good uh, black box sanctuary in Tadoba in central India. Yeah. Hmm. You can hear me still? I can hear you. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. You, so yeah. it is of grasslands and uh, 
um and they don't live in forests not not in the western ghats but more in the central grasslands and uh, recently the threat to this is uh, karanja sohal and katepurna black box sanctuaries uh there is a super express highway running through these black box sanctuaries and into another sanctuary called the tansa lake sanctuary which is another haven for birds um so uh, it is a extension to an existing highway it's been called the fifth package to that highway so there's already a highway existing and they're kind of extending it widening it adding more uh, perhaps uh, branches to it um what what is worth uh, mention here is our uh, neglect of grassland uh, ecosystems grassland ecosystems easily get clearance as compared to forests uh, but but that is because our eyes don't see forests are very visually appealing but grasslands host uh, uh an important ecosystem as well as they play a very important function uh, something trees don't do for instance they hold soil much better than trees so if there's a lake naturally there's a grassland around it if you remove the grassland when rain falls the lake gets silted and it gets covered up if you remove a grassland around water bodies there are a lot of water bodies in these places right now and tansa well uh, lake sanctuary is a big uh, uh, water body based uh, protected area if you affect the grasslands here you will kill the water bodies and if you sometimes the the rectification is to plant trees trees don't hold soil as well as grass look at the density of grass here you can pour water all your life and no soil will run and especially top soil health is dependent on grasslands and uh, this is also a project which is absolutely not being talked about and of course uh, in the surface of things we are not we are unable to decide what to fight for and what not to uh, but this needs visibility as well and this is a place where uh, uh, the black buck roams in large numbers one of the few places it still does yeah okay. how are we for time we have 15 minutes more Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you need to be somewhere? No, no, no. I, I'll just. Uh, I'm just. Uh, we, let's hope we cover everything. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is the seventh question. So I think we have four more, or must okay. be my or the eighth question. Uh. Okay. So. In this valley, tribes and tigers live in rare coexistence. Let me go there. And okay. yeah i think everyone has got this correct yeah. yes we've got a lot of responses for this and i think everyone's got this correct so do you want to go ahead yeah. and say yeah so this is dibang valley One and second, it's fantastic um, yeah it's it's just fantastic that everyone knows this like that means that whoever is in like everyone whoever is fighting for this cause has pretty much you know done its done their job okay go ahead yeah so uh, i mean it's fantastic that it's it is getting the visibility it is getting and uh, yeah uh, yeah of course there is a dam there huge huge dam coming there and it threatens to inundate raise down 2.8 lakh trees old growth trees but as well as uh, displace 14000 idu mishmi people now to put it very uh, briefly the idu mishmi are part of that landscape are are a local indigenous people whose uh, taboos you know they in their language trees and rivers and mountains are animate a beings just like the tiger and the and the uh, birds there uh, um and for for them uh, the in their poetic sense in some of the videos which have been shared they are speaking of rivers as things which are which are flowing and growing and and, and feeling and a dam is like clotting it it's ravening it its belly open you know and i'm so evocative to hear that and uh, a very very significant thing about this place as is with uh, many other indigenous uh, uh, forests uh, where where these people live is that tigers are found in these places four point the density is 4.5 times more it's a uh, work done by sail nijawan uh, a scientist uh, published in 2018 in the community owned areas than in the wildlife sanctuary itself so there is this strange mysterious uh, 
unpalpable understanding and and, and the mutual respect the tigers and the people have there uh, as well as other rare species like mishmi takin and uh, some birds which are found nowhere else so that is that is something you don't hear about at all a top predator and humans living in a, a strange harmony um that that is perhaps one of the most special things about this place yeah yeah uh so yeah uh what came to my mind when you were saying this was the fact that i i don't know i don't know how this just popped in my ha- mind when i'm like do these people suffer from anxiety and depression i don't know but uh we live in a city and we are in our four walls cut off from in nature we not many of us have animals at home but my question would be these people who are in nature and who are doing the things that they are doing have this strong connection with animals are they suffering from anxiety it's, it's and a from pertinent question a uh, very pertinent question because the migrant labor crisis we are facing and other kinds of people who are uh, um kind of roaming the lands without a place to belong these a lot of them are displaced people from their local lands india has over 40 million uh, dam refugees and the source for that information is south asian network for dams rivers and people uh, right from the narmada dam to hirakud uh, 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 several dams built here also this is not the first dam coming in this region but it is the biggest one yeah so so about their psychological uh, and and uh, sociological state is is a uh, important thing to look at yeah okay so the next question is where would you travel to see mystica swamps mystica swamps okay and the answer is western ghats okay so like, yeah so yeah it's the western ghats but the mystica swamps are these are these trees uh, these trees are very special because they have knee roots they live in fresh water swamps in what are called first order streams which means when rain falls or when there are springs in the mountains they are first swamps and then they slowly uh, become uh, rivers or uh, small streams and then they join to become bigger streams and then they come even more bigger streams so these with this vegetation lives in the first order streams and there are exactly two places where you can find them one is place in kerala others here in uttara kannada uh, northern part of karnataka they are the most critically endangered forest ecosystem in our country they are found in these two spots which you can circle on the map and uh, this is what they look like a lot of amphibians um insects other kinds of lesser fauna endemic to this place and here uh, uh this is a guy i pulled out of uh, sanjana's this thing a uh, hubli ankola railway line is coming uh, you mm. can see it right uh, yeah yeah it it is coming next to the crystal rock highway line which is already existing there it will save you 90 minutes of time this thing because the uh, if you want to develop over the already existing line it's it's a parallel line and it is cutting straight through the heart of uh, the mystica swamps um and 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 one of the good things is that people in karnataka are fighting uh, tooth and nail for this and 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 uh, hopefully this this project will be uh, uh, mitigated or scrapped even hopefully yeah hmm yeah okay and i think this is the last question yeah is uh, which is the only rainforest with seven species of wild cats mm-hmm. and uh, we have multiple varied answers here sundarban dibang valley dehing patkai yeah those are all what people have answered okay so yeah it's it's dehing patkai where uh, 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 very well known indian scientist kashmira kakati 
she was doing a research on hollow gibbons and she was putting camera traps and she was finding in a camera traps of course gibbons but also seven other species of cats now i'm going to use this picture this is a piece of art by ajay saikya from assam uh let's talk about the students movement the thing about the dibang uh, the dehing patkai protest is that it is unlike any other protest before it is the most radically artistic protest i have seen i've been in and followed numerous here and other parts of the world hundreds upon hundreds of artwork is deluging social media check your instagram under the hashtag save dehing patkai hashtag i am dehing patkai people students largely are making art and they are inundating social media and it made the cm turn and say i'm going to look at this place so there's a open cast coal mine proposed here in a very important uh, elephant reserve within the daing patkai region um and people are protesting it because it is the northernmost lowland rainforest and uh, so these are the various uh, seven wild cats now if somebody is interested you can name all of it maybe uh, fff can put a story uh, asking people to name the wild cats yeah. so this is so well drawn and i'm going to show some of the artwork which is uh, emerging uh, which has emerged i've just chosen a few uh, this is by uh, arijit uh, from assam again showing the coal mine behind and then elephants walking into paddy fields hmm. human elephant conflict Hmm. is really connected to habitat loss more than anything and when there is habitat loss when you lose when you are a local and when you lose your lives uh, or the, your years harvest to elephants because they don't have their forest uh, their bamboo and everything else left and they come to your banana and your paddy to eat them there are retaliatory killings and the people to be blamed there are, are those uh who are vulnerable uh, in those region are uh, 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 or is it the powers who are uh, clearing these forests and causing these uh, uh, elephant uh, human conflicts it's it's a very important question especially presently where there's a lot of outrage about uh, elephant killing which is a retaliatory killing but the root cause of it being rampant destruction of elephant habitat yeah um here's another very powerful uh, piece of work um showing the violence of coal mining wow so this this is by uh, so this is by jumon takuria this is by kunti patel she is done for dibang valley showing hmm. various ghost animals i mean it's haunting to see this so when the dam comes these will be these will vanish and then they they kind of floating like ghosts they including the mishmi and the and the little hmm. cottages yeah This, this I saw the my, animation video of this one. It was beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is also a very, very well done piece of art by Mihika Sen. Here you find all the Schedule One species found in Dehing Patkai: slow loris, mm. uh, sun bear, tiger, white-winged woodwork, elephant, Chinese pangolin, hula gibbon. All of these are Schedule One, very, very protected species. So uh, it's it's a very well-researched piece of art. uh the specific hmm. uh, one so yes i think the dehing patkai metaphor is a very strong one and other uh, protests are following cue it is that protests need to be artistic need to be creative imaginative and there are songs and raps emerging and uh, uh and that is really changing the the scene of protests you, uh, uh there is a lot of storytelling happening and it's not just about going there feeling anger and rawly uh expressing it but but you know there is a very famous saying in uh, in a uh in a in a play english play is that one a child asks a man uh will there be singing during the dark times and the man says yes there will also be singing about the dark times and i think this is singing about the dark times very um, true powerful and evocative yeah yeah um, uh this yeah. also reminds me when you were talking about the rap songs and everything even when the ra protests were happening um a lot of people got together and it actually became a sunday at ra for so many people that literally i went there every sunday and i became friends 
I knew people like we would be saying hi and everyone had their artwork. There were people who came up with music. They started playing like someone would get the jembe. They would start playing the jembe and they would rap. And so, yeah, as in, I, I completely know what you say by this whole different form of activism and protests, which is so important. You know, everyone needs to realize that we just don't. It's not that we want to fight we are not against something we are literally trying to ask them to listen to us and see what we are talking about because this is so important for us and for the animals and for the entire like for our ecosystem because we need to take responsibility for our forests so that we can at least save that and that amount of worry about global warming climate change will come down because we need to understand it's a circular effect. It's not just, you know, one place. Like It's like how the Amazon burning did affect us. So our forests are going to affect everything else. So it needs to be spoken up about. Yes, so I think this is the end of the session. Uh, I enjoyed this past one hour. I think I got an insane amount of knowledge and... Yes, I hope we can do this again and I hope we can sit down and I can listen to all your experiences because obviously that's so beautiful that there's some there are people out there who are doing this. And uh, I would like, because there are also youngsters listening to this, is there anything as someone who does this, do you have, uh, do you have anything to say for them to, uh, I don't know, be interested in this so they can... No. I think we, we've spoken about a lot of uh, bad news. Uh, yes. Let's look at the good news uh, also, uh, for which we have been fighting for and, and, and which has borne fruit. Two projects have been either deferred or cancelled. You want to close your of... screen? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so two uh, proposals have have taken a hit because of the kind of campaigning, especially the young. Um, I think Deng Patka is also moving uh, to that uh, zone because of something which was formed recently called the Northeast uh, Solidarity for Environmental Justice of universities, 19 different student organizations coming together and protesting three huge projects, Deng Patka, Dibang Valley and Dibru Saikwa National Park, where oil drilling has been allowed. And the Assam government is saying, for the but hey, we have not allowed it yet. I don't, uh, and and it's giving cues as to its anxiety. It's saying we are hearing you, <laughs> we are heeding. Uh, you know, NBWL has given its approval, but we have to allow it. The forest uh, uh, appraisal committee has to give its uh, final nod. That has not happened, so you, you know, uh, hold it a bit. You know, so so they're feeling the pressure. And uh, one project which has been cancelled or put under review uh, is the Parke Tiger Reserve just before the lockdown, which was. Uh, proposed through uh, Pake in Arunachal Pradesh, another uh, uh, biodiverse region. Uh, a few, we made a huge hue and cry on Twitter and uh, we sent emails. Thousands of people participated and the Chief Minister Pema Kandu said, I'm putting this on review. I think, uh, uh, you know, people find this important. He said those, uh, I think we need to protect our forests. He said that in his tweet and uh, he put it on review. And then the EIA, uh, the disastrous notification, which uh, whose no uh, notice period was in uh, late, uh, you know, late May, because of the noise we made, it has been uh, the uh, the government put in its website that there will be too many public representations, so we are deferring it till June thirtieth. Now we need to get it withdrawn, so let's make even more noise. But but this is a small victory, so things yeah. are happening and. One of the things we are learning is that injustice and, and atrocities um, breed on and feed off silence. And then and, and, and when, when there is, uh, you know, noise and speech about it, uh, they find it difficult to, uh, you know, creep in. And uh, I think the, in that uh, context, the Deng Patkai metaphor is something fantastic in the ways in which all the imaginative and new means in which it's expressing it's uh, disapproval uh, for this yeah. whole thing, which is both moving uh, as well as powerful. Yeah. 
and uh, one more thing is uh, i would like to also put in is that everyone gets scared because they think that they will be the only ones fighting for it but uh, i feel like as if they also need to realize that maybe in their group they might be the only one but once they see the come to the other side and see the number of people who are actually raising up their voices you would know that that's a huge number so if if anyone does feel even a little bit that you know they need to raise as in like make it known that they are not liking it or disapproving of it if you just raise your voice you will realize that there's this entire it's it's for me it was like entering into a different world altogether where there were so many people who actually want to make a difference you know and that's so motivating and that's that makes me feel like doing more so i just feel like as if people need to just cross that little bit of that one step and then they will see a different world all together yes thank you yuvan thank you for this thank and you. uh i hope we can do this again maybe with more um maybe a, like we can have a more interactive session with more people personally i don't like youtube lives sorry <laughs> i find okay. this yeah. is my first youtube live i feel like i feel <laughs> like i'm in a strange zone yeah um, exactly yeah. like at least yeah. the other zooms you're so used to people just randomly chatting some interaction yeah but yeah okay thank you so much thank you and thank you for having me yes okay. and i think this is the end of our 12 hour marathon <laughs> that we uh, planned and uh, happy environment day by the way which we didn't <laughs> uh and uh, yes good night everyone thank you and good night yuvan thank you <laughs>